up in France. His mother was uh, Pika. She was French. His father was away on business in France when he was born. So when he came back, he started calling the baby Francesco, which is a little Frenchman, and the name stuck. So Francesco uh, was his, what he was called by everybody, even though Giovanni was his official name. And his childhood, as I tell the story of his childhood, it's going to sound a lot like that of, of Augustine. Remember what Augustine's childhood was like? Uh, well, Francis, his father, uh, Peter Bernardoni, he was a merchant of cloth was a, a new business really starting to, to spread and because of the opening of the trade routes with the crusades people could buy and sell cloth from long distances and so he was making good money as a, as a merchant there of cloth. Uh, he was used to getting his own way and he was the boss. He was a bit of a local community there and he longed to rise in social order. He had a lot like Augustine's father. And of course, he wanted the same for his sons, Francis and, and Angelo. So he sent Francis off to school to get a good education, but he's not a very good student. Francis never learned to read and write very well. Education is not very important to him. But the thing that captured his imagination was the literature of chivalry, cult of chivalry. Knights and romance. You know, knights fighting for loyalty and bravery uh, and love. Charlemagne and Knights from Around the Table, all these things we've been talking about are things that, that captured his imagination. So for Augustine, it was Virgil and you know those ancient stories. Uh, now it's the whole cult of chivalry that is getting Francis excited. So he grew up as a spoiled son of a wealthy merchant. His dad had a lot of money. He didn't have a lot of responsibility. So he liked to hang out with his friends. They would go to parties. They would party late into the night. They would chase girls. They would cause all kind of minor mischief there in the town of Assisi. People rolled their eyes. Here they come again. And Francis was kind of the ringleader of this. Very charismatic personality. People liked him, and people liked him because he liked to pay for the parties. So you know, people are going to hang around with him because he's going to pay for, for our, our parties. One biographer said he was an object of admiration to all. He endeavored to surpass others in flamboyant display of vain accomplishments. Just like Augustine. All my friends, you know, they're doing a lot of crazy things too. Why are they going to let them pass me up? I'm going to be like that and show them how we're, we're, what it's really like. But Francis is kind of the same thing. Uh, hey, look, you, you think you guys think you know how to party? Let me show you how to party. And so he was the life of the party. And of course, what better way to achieve glory and honor than as a knight? So he joined the local military. This is a time of great upheaval. You have these local rulers who are all fighting with each other. The CC is almost always fighting with the Holy Roman Empire. I'm going to try it back up right here. Uh, and so alliances were formed and then they fell apart. In 1202, Assisi found itself in conflict once again with their ancient rival Perugia. Perugia, which is very close. You know, it's like high schools, high school rivalries. They're always fighting with each other. Well, in November uh, 1202, uh, they're at war with each other. Uh, they're, they're fighting against each other. Perugia has the upper hand, and they completely wipe out the forces of Assisi. And they slaughter everybody. People try to hide. People try to run away. They're all killed, except for those who might bring in a ransom. Like the 21-year-old son of a wealthy cloth merchant, perhaps. So he's captured in battle. And they take him to the dungeon, where he spends a year in the dungeon. It takes a year for them to make the arrangements for the ransom and for the father to actually get the money and, and get him out of the prison. So he spends a year in a dark dungeon. That's a hard time for him. Emotionally, physically, it takes a toll on him. But he gets out, and he's depressed for a while. He's bedridden for a while. He start, starts to walk with a cane. He has to build his strength back up. But after a few years of recuperating, and... He starts to get the itch to fight again. And so he signs on to join a local count who's going off to a, some battle. Now, although he wasn't a knight yet, he wanted to look like a knight. And Tim already talked about how it's quite an expensive endeavor to become a knight. You have to, you have to get the, the chain mail, you have the helmet, you've got the lance, you've got the sword, and you have a horse. You have to have a squire who's going to help you get all this stuff on. I mean, just getting dressed is a chore if you're a knight. So the squire has to help you. Do, this is a lot of money it takes to do this. And by the way, I don't know if you're going to talk about this, Tim. One of the other technical changes that was important this time was the high back saddle. Because when you are jousting, 
Or you're at war, you've got the weight of this thousand pound horse in armor, and this knight in armor, charging at 35, 40 miles an hour, and all that force comes down to the point of the lance. So you think, how many thousands of pounds per square inch of force is hitting somebody with, uh, with the lance? That's a lot of pressure. But it's also coming back on you, right? So if you've got the lance in your arm, you're hitting somebody at 45, 40 miles an hour, it's going to knock you back off your horse. So they develop a high back saddle to help them stay in, and now you can apply that force without being fear of being knocked off. There's a lot of technical changes going on here, uh, a lot of money involved. So his dad bailed him out of prison, now equips him with all the... He looks like a high school kid who says, Hey, Dad, I want a car. And Dad says, Okay. And he says, Well, not that car. I want the BMW over here. Uh, okay. So he gets him a nice setup. Well, he's on his way. One day into the journey on their way to battle. And he sees another knight, a real knight, uh, whose equipment was bedraggled and it was worn. It was beaten up. And August, uh, Francis felt, felt bad for him and gave him his equipment. Okay. Gave him the armor. Dad, explain that to your dad. Dad, I wrecked the BMW. You know? <laughs> I gave it away. Yeah, because he had a dream at night. The dream said, it was God speaking to him. And God said, who can do more for you? The Lord or the servant? Well, the Lord came. So the voice said, so why are you spending all your time with the servant? Why not spend your time serving the Lord? And so that's what he decided he was going to do. He gave his equipment to a knight. He went back home and said I, he never took up a sword or military equipment again. Uh, because he decided to serve the Lord at this point. And slowly, Francis began to change. Uh, one day, he's, he's walk, working in his father's shop, and a beggar comes in for some money, and he ignores him. The beggar's still there, so finally he tells him, just go away. Leave us alone. And the beggar walked out, and he felt bad that he treated him so rudely. So he he realizes, you know, if this guy had come asking for money for some noble, for some important person, I would have given it to him. So why wouldn't I do that for the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings? So he grabs a bunch of money from his father's chest there and runs out after the beggar and gives it to him. What a great gesture. Unless you're dad, right? Because you don't feel really good about this. See, Francis developed this habit of giving things away to poor people. They would ask for things and he would give it to them. Crazy stuff like that. And if he didn't have any money on him, he would give him the belt. Or his tunic. Or sometimes his shirt off his back. Francis was always given to people who were in need. And slowly he began to change and become, reflect more of the, the spirit of Christ. He made a pilgrimage to Rome uh, with some of his friends. And when he's arrived, remember urbanization? Things are changing. He gets to Rome and he goes to all these pilgrim sites. And anytime you go to a pilgrimage site, who are you going to see there? Beggars, yeah. It's right the beggars because they want lots of money. And so he sees all these beggars in Rome, hundreds of them. And he sees all these tourists coming in and out and taking pictures and, you know, with their nice stuff and buying postcards and t-shirts, but they're not helping the beggars. And he's shocked. You're not, you're not helping these beggars. And he wonders what it's like to be a beggar. So he takes off all his middle class clothing and he puts on the rags as a beggar and he spends a day as a beggar in Rome. Can I just hang out with you here? And he walks around with them and begs for money. He eats their food. And his friends who are with him put a stop to that pretty quickly. Uh, but he's trying to get an experiment here, trying to learn what this is like to beg for what you need. Now, the Italian countryside was dotted with small churches or chapels, uh, many of which were falling apart from neglect. Uh, one such church was at San Damiano, less than a mile away from Assisi. So he, he would go down there and spend a lot of time in prayer. There was a Byzantine artwork, a cross of Christ. And this is the actual one here on the left. A Byzantine picture of Jesus on the cross. He would spend hours there in prayer in front of this, this crucifix. One day as he's there in prayer, he hears a voice saying, Francis, go and repair my church because you can see that it's fallen into disarray. And never had he heard such a clear command. He's been felt the call of God before, but this was clear as a bell to him. And in fact, he was kind of surprised. And so he immediately said, I'm going to obey this. And I'm going to rebuild this San Damiano church that has fallen apart. But it needs money. So he runs back to his father's shop, gathers a bunch of cloth, expensive cloth, scarlet, things like that, and he takes it, he hops on the family horse, 
rides about 15 miles to a, a place where there's a, a merchant set up, where there's a trade going on, and uh, he sells all the cloth, and then he sells the horse, walks back 15 miles back home, takes the money, goes into the chapel here, the priest, and says, here, ka-chink, here's a bag of money. The priest was like, well, hey, a second, he, he knew about his reputation, and he knew about his father's reputation. I'm not going to take money from the son of Peter Bernadoni, you know, unless he knows about this. So the priest said, no, no, thank you. And Francis said, well, if you're not going to take the money, will you take me? Okay. And so Francis started rebuilding the chapel with his bare hands. Uh, he would he lived there in the chapel for a period of time and just rebuilding it. And when he needed money, he would go back and he would take, and his father would stop that, of course, so he'd go out begging. He would live there in a chapel or a nearby cave for weeks, months at a time, and then he'd go out to the streets of the CC and beg for money to rebuild the chapel. Now his father was not happy. He was, he spent his lifetime building his reputation, building up his business, he was a well-respected businessman in CC, and there was his son out in the public arena, walking around, dirty, in the rags of a, of a beggar, begging for money? You can't have this. I don't have all these years of work I put into this place, and given to my, that boy. And so he went out and grabbed his son, took him home, and actually chained him in the basement. <laughs> Which sounds pretty severe, but you know, it actually wasn't as uncommon as you might think back then. A lot of houses had little prisons that they would, you know, keep grandma locked up for a while if you got too out. <laughs> so he was, he was chained in the basement there for a while. His dad went away on a business trip, and mom, who was a very godly person, Pika, she was a very godly lady, and she felt bad for, for Francis and kind of understood his calling, and so she released him. What does he do? He immediately goes back to San Damiano and starts building the place, taking some money there. And his father gets back from a business trip and says, what have you done? He goes down there to the chapel and says, come with me. And Francis refuses this. He's finally going to stand up to his dad. Finally, he's had enough. And his dad says, okay, if you're not going to come with me, I'll take care of this. And he goes back to his CC and he files a lawsuit against his son. Because he's been taking all of his belongings and giving them to the poor, building his church. We can't have this. So he files a lawsuit. But because Francis is living in a church, he's not under secular control. It's part of the ecclesiastical area, right? The church has to judge on this. So the father says, okay. He goes to the bishop. He actually has quite a bit of money. The bishop is sympathetic to the father. And he says, my son, he's taking my money without my permission. He's giving it away. We can't have this. So the bishop says, I'll hear the case. They come in. But the father, Peter Bernadoni, makes the case about his son. He was taking all this thing. After I've loved the boy and given him everything that he has and everything that he could want, he takes my money and gives it to him. And then the bishop says, well, Francis, it, it is, you need to give back the money. If you want to serve God, that's good. But you can't serve God with the money that... You've taken wrong. And Francis said, you're right. Great respect, great respect for the, the bishop. And he always did. And so he says, you're right. I'll give him back the money and anything else he's given. So he walks into the room, takes off his clothes, folds them into a neat pile, comes back in, butt naked, in front of the, in the plaza there, with this whole court case to take, all these people are gathered around, butt naked. Here, Dad. <laughs> He piled of clothes with a bag of money on top. And Peter realized he's been humiliated. He turns, he just leaves, he stomps out. And we never hear from him again. We, if they ever reconcile, we don't know about it. Uh, he doesn't want anything to do with this stuff. Because he said, as Francis is giving this to his dad, he said, No longer will I say, My father, Peter Bertanoni. From this point on, I will say, My father in heaven. So he disowned his father. And the father died. So here's a picture of him doing this. Uh, you see the, the hand up in heaven there in the picture. Most of these pictures by Giotto, who did a whole display in a church there of, um, of the life of Francis. Uh, you'll see the similarities here. So he's, he's rejecting his father, he's taking off the clothes, and there's the hand in heaven. This is my father now in heaven. Father storms out. The bishop feels bad for him and probably a little embarrassed. Takes off his 
his velvet robe and wraps it around Francis, sends him on his way. Francis goes back to San Damiano. He takes on the, the garb of a, a monk at that point, a robe, leather belt, sandals, and staff, and he sends back the velvet robe to the, the bishop there. So he, uh, he, he starts to become more and more feeling the call of God. And it begins to change even more here. Uh, one of the stories is told about how he'd always been repulsed by leprosy. And he grew up in a privileged household. And lepers, there were a lot of leper colonies around. And he was very repulsed by them. Sometimes he would give them money, but if he did, he would send it with somebody else. Or he would actually, literally, he would turn his head, hold his nose when I gave him money because they stink so bad. They're just gross to look at. And he realized this wasn't right. So he said, I've got to get over this. And so next time he saw a leper, he went up to him, handed him the money, and took his decaying hand and kissed his hand. And the leper returned the favor, gave him a kiss. And then he said, okay. You know, so he's taking a step at a time. So the next thing he does, he goes and he lives in a leper colony. He takes care of them. He kisses them. He bathes them. He nurses them. Just to experience what this is like and uh, to try to follow the call of God. A few years later, he hears the words from Matthew 10, where Jesus sends his followers out. He says, Take no gold or silver with you. Take a bag of money. Don't take a second tunic. Don't take a pair of sandals or a staff. And this hits Frank's like a ton of bricks. And this, he's found his calling. This is what he's going to do. So he takes the, the, and he's already dressed like a hermit, but now he decides to get rid of all that. No more leather belt, now it's just a rope. The brown coarse tunic. He gets rid of the staff, he gets rid of, mm, mm, very far, the sandals there. He goes barefoot. Because that's what Jesus said. This is, this is the way he lives his life. If Jesus said something, he is going to do it. He's not going to hold back. He's going to throw himself in 100%. And so from that point on, he devoted himself to complete obedience and humility. Uh, he would give things to the poor. He ran the cities preaching and helping people. Uh, he went and saw it, but other people started to gather around him. His friends, his wealthy friends, were drawn to this <coughs> passion. And, hey, Francis, can, can I do that too? Come join me, brother. Come join me, brother. And he started to develop these people who would gather with him and pray with him and give to the poor and dress like him and live in complete poverty and humility and obedience. And so he went to the Pope and requested to be made an official order. And the Pope wasn't too thrilled about this at, at first. Um, he, saw, he saw Francis' sincerity. He actually gave him a trial period, said you go away and come back after a while and we'll see. Uh, Francis went away and continued to live like this came back and the Pope finally gave him his blessing. The, the, the Franciscan, Franciscan order, or what the official name is, the Order of Friars Minor, Little Brothers. He's called everybody Little Brother. And so these brothers gathered together, and they became the Franciscans, and with the blessing of the Pope. And they all wore the same clothing, and they all got the tonsure. I'm working on mine. I'm, it's a natural <laughs> one. Okay? You know, where you, where you cut your hair right there to show your, uh, your penance. A lot of stories about Francis, and some are clearly not true. Uh, but I, I love the way Tim put it yesterday. It doesn't really matter in all these cases. There's so many stories about him preaching to the birds. Birds, give glory to God because God has given you wings to fly and a clear air to fly in, and he, he takes care of you day by day without you worrying. Where does he get that from? Uh -huh. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, right? God takes care. And so he's saying, give praise to God, birds, and the birds will sit there and listen. Several stories. Now, is that true or not? Well, that's not the point. The point is, there are so many stories of him doing that that tells you something about his nature, right? He's very much, uh, he preaches to nature. Now, there's one story, way out there, about a wolf that was terrorizing a town. And he goes out there to meet with the wolf and says, Brother Wolf, yeah. please do not pick on God's children. That's not a nice thing to do. And so the wolf nods and walks off and becomes a vegetarian. You know? <laughs> Okay, so not, not necessarily that, that the case. But you do have all these stories of him. Now, I mean, he lives in nature. This is what he wears. And he sleeps, he sleeps on the ground. No black blanket. Uh, they, 
they cannot own property. This became one of the things as he's building up this, this following. And now dozens and hundreds of people are wanting to follow Francis. They're coming from all over Europe when they hear about this godly man. But there's this, this tension there. Because as they come, they go, wait, you want what? i got to do what? I can't live in a house. I can live out, you know. I can live in, I can stay inside, but I can't own anything. And that was Francis' thing. You cannot own anything. Jesus said, don't take any gold or silver with you. One tunic, no sandals. You cannot own anything. They're like, well, how about just something little? My iPod? You know, something. And so this, this began to become a strain on him. Um, and how do, you, how do you manage this? How do you manage a group of people who want to follow him and yet want to change what he's doing? Uh, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. He also attracted, uh, we, he drew up a rule for his order, which said you cannot own anything. It's how you dress, here's what you have to do. They would say like 25 our fathers before every meal. I mean, it was that kind of, kind of thing. You'd sleep on the ground. Um, he also attracted some, some women followers, prevalent one being Claire. Claire was the daughter of a wealthy merchant in Assisi, and she was attracted to about 18 at this time. Imagine explaining that to your dad. Dad, I want to go live with this wild man in the wilderness. You know, her father said, absolutely not. She went to San down, down to the church at San Damiano, and she would pray with them, and uh, uh, she finally... At one point, she got the cut off her hair and got the tonsure to show her a sign of, uh, of penance too. And her father went down to get her, and, and he and some friends literally grabbed her or dragged her out of the church. You're going to come home with me, young lady, hang me, run forever, and you will never get to leave again. And as they're pulling her out, her, her hood falls off, and he sees her hair cut to the tonsure, and he realizes she's, she's committed her life to this. So he says, fine, it wants nothing to do with her. And so Claire now, she becomes one of the followers. Well, Francis was very, very careful about purity, being chaste. Uh, if he felt sexual desire coming upon him, he would, he would, there's stories of him running into the stream, like the, the breaking the ice and running in the stream, or jumping to a snow pile, you know, as the equivalent of a cold shower, until the passion passed away, he's just trying to survive. And so he can't have Claire live with them, so they start their own group, the poor Claire's. And so women start to gather around her now. I mean, she's got the whole story of her own. And she's living the same kind of lifestyle. This is a rough time when there's not a lot of, we're talking about protection. You've got a bunch of women who are living unprotected. Uh, and they're really trusting God in this. You know, somebody comes to rob them, they're not, they can't fight them off. There's no, nobody's going to protect them. So it's a real act of faith and devotion for them to do this. During the, what's one of my favorite stories? During the Fifth Crusade, 1219, a Francis joins a crusade. And he's a man of peace, right? He doesn't take up a sword. He and 11 friends go on down, take a boat across the Mediterranean, and right now they're fighting in, in Egypt, um, in the Nile Delta, actually. And Al-Hakim, Al the, uh, the sultan there, he is managing this battle. There's a city under siege. And they've been there for a couple of years. And so... Francis goes down there and he ministers to the people in the city for a while, taking care of them, helping them, uh, managing their, their wounds. But he realizes that's not enough. He wants to go convert the soul. And so he sneaks across enemy lines at night. He and a friend, dressed like this. To, and, and you know, the guards catch him. Why are you here? I want to see the Sultan. I want to tell him about God. You know, and they're like, do we kill him now or do we, you know, have fun with him first? So they take him to the Sultan. And the Sultan, it's a, it's a beautiful story. Highly recommend the book. The Saint and the Sultan. <clears throat> the Crusades, Islam, and France of Sisi's Mission of Peace. If you like historical fiction, this is, this is kind of like that. It, it tells it like a novel, but extremely well researched. I mean, he's got pages of footnotes in the back here. So he's telling the story best he can, filling in some of the gaps. But it's a beautiful story of Francis Sisi preaching to the Sultan, who is, by the way, has a city under siege during the middle of a crusade. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's. Some people think he wanted to be martyred. 
And, and I think there's a possibility of that. That Francis had a desire to join Christ to be martyred. But he was such a he's such a kind guy. He showed such great respect to the Sultan. And the Sultan, in their tradition of Islam, they show great respect as well to holy men. And so the Sultan listened to him and said, No, I don't think I'll become a Christian today. You know, but thank you for asking. And he offered, he offered Francis, you know, I, I like you, Francis. You're a bit stupid, perhaps, but I like you, son. Here, take some gold, take some clothing, take some jewels, and go on and be on your way. Now, we don't know if that was a test or not. But Francis said, no, thank you. And he, he kind of insisted, trying to get him to take some things with him. And Francis finally said, the greatest honor you can give me would be let me share a meal with you. And so he sat, sat down, he and his companion, sat down with the sultan and all of his entourage there, and shared a meal with the sultan. And send him on his way. Now, later on, uh, Francis would commission some of his followers to go on mission trips to places where Islam was strong and try to convert the Muslims. But it was always their peace, learn their languages, learn their customs, treat them with respect. And this was the way he was trying to demonstrate how would Christ evangelize a Muslim? And so that was what he was called to do. At 1220, he turned administration over to others and devoted himself more to the prayer and invitation of Christ. And the two of the most memorable events in his life happened towards the end of his life here. The first one involved the birth of Christ. For Francis, there was no feast greater than Christmas. The idea of God coming down in human flesh as a baby dependent upon its mother just brought him to tears. He would spend hours thinking about this and just, just weep about this. And finally, you know, now that he's not in control, charge of the, of the whole order here, he has some, some free time. And he said, I wonder what this is like. And so he convinces a friend of his who owns some property near there. There's some caves by there. And he, he, about two weeks before Christmas, he starts to set this up. And he has a manger with a donkey and an ox. There's hay. They find a young mother with a baby and put it in the manger. Because he says, I want to see through my own eyes and experience as much as possible what it was like when God became a baby. And so he publicized this and people from the town came out and the, the friars there came with him. And one of the biographers talks about, described the scene as they're all marching out at Christmas Eve with torches and with candles to this place where the baby's lying in the manger and there's ox. What do we call that today? <laughs> Living nativity. Most scholars think France was the first person to do this. They said, that's cool. You know, they did the next year, the next year. And then it began to spread all over Europe as people said, wow, that's, that's really neat. And he may be the first person to have done that. The second event concerned the death of Christ. September 1224, uh, Francis went on a 40 day fast, which he did frequently. Uh, it, it, it's funny because Augustine was a vegetarian. And with all his wealth and power, he's a vegetarian. He ate mostly vegetables all of his life. Uh, Francis was not, but he ate very little. He would often go on 40-day fast, maybe have one small meal a day. Uh, when he was begging for food, for example, he would go into town in Assisi and beg for food, and people would give him scraps, leftovers. You know, I was going to throw this away, I was going to give this to the dog, but here, you can have it. And he would take it and, he, and you know, gag and look at it, it's awful. But he, he would eat it and say, Okay, it works. And so he, he would eat very, very little. He went this 40 day fast uh, up into a, a mountain in Tuscany as a from friend there. And while he's in prayer there, he has a vision of an angel, an angel with six wings. Hmm, where do we see that? Uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Revelation, six wings, but with his arms nailed to a cross. And as he's contemplating this vision during this time of, of fasting, um, Something begins to happen to him. When the vision disappeared, he left in his heart a marvelous fire and imprinted in his flesh the likeness of signs no less marvelous. Wounds appeared on each hand, in each foot, and on his side. Wounds that would bleed periodically. And they came to be called stigmata. Stigmata is simply a Greek word which means marks. Uh, Paul gives this word in Galatians 6. I carry in my body the marks of Jesus First, uh, Galatians 6, verse 17. That word marks there is stigmata, the marks of Jesus. And uh, carried over to Latin Vulgate translation, which would have been the common translation they used during that day. Now, Francis didn't obsess over this. He didn't brag about it or show people that. He tried to hide it. Uh, he often wore shoes 
after this point. He had it before, but now he's wearing shoes to kind of cover up the marks a little bit. Uh, he tried to hide it from even his closest family and friends, but eventually they saw, you know, what's going on? You're, you're bleeding again. And he told them the story. You know, but don't tell anybody else. He, he didn't want to publicize this. He didn't want to make a big deal about it. This was something given to him by God, he <coughs> cherished. Um, so he's the first person in history to exhibit stigmata. Now since then, there have been dozens of reports of people doing it. Uh, some have been frauds that they've discovered. Some have been pretty well documented cases. Now what do you do with that? Well, as a learned Bible scholar here, and somebody who studied this all my life, I can tell you, I don't have a clue. Um, a lot of scholars who study these kind of things, they, they think that his deep emotional state and psychological state actually caused physical things to happen to him. That his mind convinced his body to produce the wound. I don't know. Maybe he did it to himself. Not an effort to deceive, but as a, you know, just this altered state of mind where he's doing this to himself. But his desire was to be like Christ. And that's why this happened. And this brought him such peace because... Now I'm becoming like Christ. I'm bearing the wounds of Christ. And he took us as a great sign and honor from God. A great miracle. Uh, this is the um, Berlingeri altarpiece uh, at Pestia. Uh, it depicts him with the wounds in his hands and on his feet. This was painted less than a decade after his, his death. A very, it's a life-size depiction, about five feet tall. He's not a big guy. Um, and the scenes around there are scenes from his life. Uh, up there in the top, yeah. Up there in the top left, you've got him having a vision of this six-winged creature. Uh, down below that, you got him preaching to the birds there. All these birds sitting on the hill while Francis preaches to them. The other scenes are miracles that happened uh, after his death. Um, and I want to, you know, when you when you don't own anything, you don't need pockets. And so ropes are in the pockets. They never anticipated having, you know, hardware. And, yeah. Microphones. Can you just kind of pass this out? Uh, shortly before his death, his body's wearing out. Uh, he became blind. He got some infections. I mean, the guy is he had osteoporosis. Can you identify with that? He's not taking multivitamins. He's not eating a very good diet. You know, low in protein. Uh, low in everything, low in calories. He, he is weak, he's emaciated. Uh, osteoporosis, uh, he may have caused some disease while he's down in Egypt, taking care of all his people, may have caused some leprosy. He got some an infection in his eyes when he was down in Egypt, and uh, they, they tried to take care of his eyes, but he's practically blind by this point. And the guy's like 45 years old. Uh, we've got the body of a, I don't want to get what I say here. Uh, right. And he's a very, very, very old person, all right? And he's not seen a lot of doctors and, you know, no hip replacements or anything. So, as is happening, he writes one of the most famous pieces, The Canticle to Brother Sun. Uh, and you've got it there. Um, Brother Sun, Sister Moon. You know, so he's known as the, the, the saint who loves nature. And he, and he does. And he praises God through nature. But it, it's not... Praising nature, praising God through nature. You see this all throughout here. It starts off, most high, all powerful God, yours are the praises, the glory, the honor, and all blessing. To you alone, most high gods, they belong. No man is worthy to mention your name. And he goes through and mentions specific parts of nature. Praise be to you, my Lord, of all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun. Praise be to you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars. Praise be to you, my Lord, through Brother Wind. Praise be to you, my Lord, through sister water. He's not praising these things. He's saying, through the creation you have made, may you be praised. Now what does this sound like? Oh, yeah, it does, kind of, doesn't it? Uh, but from a biblical standpoint, where do, where do you get this idea? The Psalms, yeah. Praise the Lord, all you heavenly hosts. Praise Him, all you creatures. Praise Him, all you seas. You mountains and trees, clap your hands. You know, okay, so this is where he's getting this kind of thing. He dwells... I mean, he reads the Psalms constantly. And so he writes this, this song, The Canticle of Brother Son. There's a movie that came out in the 70s about Francis called Brother Son, Sister Moon. And it kind of presents him as kind of a late 60s, early 70s hippie, you know, jumping on the hills. I love, you know, I love the flowers and the trees. And Francis was kind of like that, you know. Uh, it kind of cuts out some of the harsher uh, parts of Francis in the movie. 
It has some very powerful scenes there, though. When he appears before the Pope, a very powerful scene. But this kind of thing you see there reflected in his song. And then it's close to his death. He's the last year of his life. In fact, the last couple weeks of his life. He composes the last stanza. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister, bodily death, from whom no living man can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are those whom death will find in your most holy will. The second death shall do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord and give Him thanks and serve Him with great humility. How does Francis feel about death? He's not afraid. I'm in God's will. Death is God's servant. You can't avoid it, even if you wanted to, but it's, it's, it's nothing to fear for God's servant. Um, and so he asked to be carried back to the, oh, the Porta Uncula, which, which is a little chapel where he'd help rebuild. And he asked to be carried, he can't walk at this point, he can't see, he has to dictate this song. He asked the brothers to sing this song as they carry him along the way. And uh, um, October 3rd, 1226, he falls asleep in the Lord. Uh, one biographer, Herbert Workman, wrote this. For a few years, for a few years, the Sermon on the Mount became a realized fact. But then the dream began to fade. Somebody actually dared to live the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, G.K. Chesterton called him the only true Christian. And here's a man who actually, whenever, probably chastity be for the vows. Whenever he read something in Scripture, he would obey it immediately. Go and sell all you have. Boom. You know, love your enemies. Boom. And so he, he committed himself to this. He was canonized the same 1228. Uh, within two years after his death, which is death, which is practically unheard of. And because he was such a well-respected, well-loved person, I mean, he had literally uh, hundreds, thousands, perhaps, of followers at this point. Franciscans. Uh, the Pope said we need to bury him in a proper place, so they built a great basilica for him to be buried. Basilica of St. Francis. What do you think about the preacher of poverty being buried in a place like this? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's trying to get out, I'm thinking. Um, he almost out Christ in Christ. Yes, he almost did, didn't he? He almost did. Uh, when they, so they moved his body here, at the Basilica, they're afraid because he was people loved him so much. They buried him under a slab of granite and then gravel and then ten bands of iron and then a 190 pound grill and then a 200 pound rock. They want to make sure nobody you know dug up this body, right? Uh, but after his death, the movement continued to grow, and there have been tensions between those who wanted to follow it, just like Francis did, and those who wanted to be more moderate position. Those tensions were always there. He was always trying to hold these things together in his own life, as people come to follow him and say, yeah, maybe, maybe you're being a bit too strict, Francis. So those tensions were always there, and after his death, they really started to develop and come out. And it's easy to be critical of people who say, I was talking to my son, Grant, about this. Why would they... Why would they go follow him and then say, no, 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 you're doing it wrong? Well, it's easy to be critical of those people, but a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, even the moderates or you know, the liberals at that point, they were, they were taking us to a level that none of us would be comfortable with. I mean, to be a, a moderate meant, okay, maybe you could have two meals a day instead of one. Uh, maybe you could actually live in a house if you don't own it, but, you, you know. And plus, there's other factors to think about. Living like this, no shoes, one tunic, that's it. That can work in central Italy, but you have Franciscans in Scandinavia. How long are you going to survive like this? You're not going to make it to the first winter, are you? And so there's some, actual, some practical concerns, you know? The question is, can you follow the spirit of St. Francis, this complete dedication devotion to chastity, to humility, to poverty, to obedience, without following exact specific examples. So that's why the Franciscans now, they've got a couple different little groups. Because some say, well, you know, in the modern world, this is what that commitment would look like. Another said, uh, Franciscans would say, no, no, round rope, rope, by the way, three knots to rope, poverty, chastity, obedience. I, I, I always remember what my commitment is to whenever I get dressed or see this book down. Um, and so they... They live like this. So there's this tension there. 
Santa Fe, New Mexico. The city's full name, it's not Santa Fe. Santa Fe means what? It's a, yeah, faith, holy, yeah, faith, holiness. Um, the real name of the city, the official name of the city, still is, is La Villa Real de la Santa Fe de San Francisco de Assisi. The royal city of the holy faith, St. Francis of Assisi. And this is the cathedral basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, this is, well, we'll get there in a second. Santa Clara. St. Clair. San Francisco. Obvious there. Okay. San Diego. San Luis Obispo. They're named after Franciscans who were friends of Francis. The chapel. Uh, this is the Port Uncle. This is the small chapel he rebuilt and is now housed inside the huge basilica of St. Francis. <laughs> Um, but the Port Uncula, which means little portion, something like that, a little small little chapel. Its official name is, uh, Port, uh, is the Basilica of St. Mary of the Angels, or Los Angeles. San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Luis Obispo, Santa Clara, all named after St. Francis or his, his followers. That's different. That's St. Anthony, who is also from that era. Uh, Jorge, uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio is also named after St. Francis. You probably know him better as Pope oh, Francis. The only, the first Pope from the Americas, the first Pope south of the equator. And when, he, when the Pope becomes Pope and he takes a name, they don't just, you know, draw a name out of a hat. They put a lot of thought into this. You know, Innocent III or, or whatever. Francis. He took the name Francis. What does that tell you about it? Yeah. He doesn't dress like the other popes do. He doesn't wear the gold ring. He wears a silver ring. Uh, he, he doesn't wear the poor vestments. He's, you see him caring for lepers and caring for the poor because this is his concern. This is compassion. And so we want to honor that by being named uh, St. Francis or Pope, Pope Francis. So the Franciscan Order is the largest of the, of the Roman Catholic orders today. You got the different branches. You got the Franciscans. You got the Second Order, which is the poor players, the female version. And then before he died, people wanted to follow him and said, "You know, I don't know how to do this." And so he started a third order, which is it's the Order of Franciscans for those who want to be real people. They're married. They have jobs. I'm I'm drawn to this. I feel passionate about this, Francis. But you know, I've got a family. I can't I can't live like that. And so he created the third order for people who live in the community, who have jobs and families, but still want to devote themselves to this kind of thing. And this has been a huge thing. Uh, final, the, some people in the third order, Michelangelo and Christopher Columbus, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So we take a 15 minute break. Yeah, you both got a minute for question. Here. Uh, what was his age when he died? 46. And what was his age when he went naked before his father? 20, uh, 25. Okay. Yeah. So, period of time there. Yeah. He, would, he, he would glory in humiliating himself. Uh, he, he couldn't touch money. He knew he could drink, but he, he couldn't touch money, you know, because he couldn't own anything. He just, money was it's a, it's a power, not a tool, it's a power. And he avoided it at all costs you know, in later life. There's a story of somebody who came into the chapel and put some money down. And one of the Franciscan brothers, they're not monks, they're, they're, they're brothers, friars, took the money, took the coin, and set it up on the, on the windowsill to get it out of the way. Later on he felt bad because he touched the, the coin, the gold coin. And he went to tell Francis, I touched the money, I'm sorry, you need to beat me, you know, do what you need to do, and I'll do penance. But Francis said, no, here's what I want you to do. Take that, go pick it up with your mouth. Walk outside and find some dung. Put it into the dung. Never touch it with your hands, just your mouth. Yeah, I did it. And that's the kind of commitment they had. At one point, uh, Francis, uh, he ate some chicken. He wasn't doing well. People gave him uh, some food to eat. It was chicken. He really enjoyed it. He enjoyed it too much. I mean, not that he ate too much, just that, man, I really like that. And he felt bad about that. So he had one of his brothers who would take him through town and, and put a rope around him and drug him through town and say, 
Behold, Francis, the glutton, who loves chicken and ate chicken, you know. It's like, he, he, anytime he did something he felt guilty about, it. he wanted people to know about it. This is act of humility and uh, almost be God. He still lives, and the Lord made me an instrument of life. He didn't write it! <laughs> I know, I hate, I hate to bring it out. Oh, Hart doesn't say something like that in this when he's talking about video. Wood. He didn't write that poem. It's, it's attributed to St. Francis. It's probably written in 1925, actually. Yeah. But, but it does take the themes that he, he lives um, that are important to him. I mean, it sounds like St. Francis, which is why it's called that. But he didn't actually write, Lord, maybe an instrument of thy peace. Uh, but it does, I think, encapsulate his lifestyle and his values very, very well. I know, I, I know you're required to sing that all the time. What's the song? Uh, Lord, maybe an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's darkness, let me sow light. I mean, he said those kind of things, but he, he just didn't write that, that poem or song that way. What about the AA prayer? Lord, give me serenity. He's a, uh, yeah, there's, you know, same thing with Augustine. These guys who are so well respected. I got this argument going to wait and fight. This guy who writes a blog. He says Augustine said this. I said no, he didn't. And because people like to attribute these things to famous people. The serenity prayer. I don't think actually was. Uh, there's no place they found it in, in his writings. There isn't. They what? No, there isn't. But, yeah, they never found a place where he has said that. So. Do you know this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, give me serenity to accept the things that. I cannot change. Yeah. To know the difference. And Living one day at a time. Which certainly encapsulates his lifestyle. He just didn't say that. That we know. Other questions, comments? Who's your tailor? Let me mention one last thing. I can't see what time it is. I'm off the hook. Um, he lived in a world where, where martyrs were everything. Uh, where you couldn't, you couldn't throw a rock in a chapel to some martyr. If you went into a, a church building, there was always altars to these martyrs. These are stories you grew up hearing. So a martyr in Rome in the 4th century meant you stood up for your faith, even if it meant death, right? You were willing to die for your faith. He lives now in a Christian era place where everybody's Christian. How do you live the life of a martyr when everybody's a Christian? And so this is what he's doing. He's, he, I, I can't become a martyr, so how can I live that? How can I give myself completely to God? And this is the way he found to do that. He's trying to channel that, that murder impulse. Knights did the same thing. Right? Will it to die for Christ? And he's trying to channel it in, in a different direction through complete humility and poverty and obedience. And uh, things, things to learn from. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the break.